Well, just to make sure this doesn't get hurt, I'm gonna move it out of the way. I came equipped. All right, as you all know, I am not Johnny Moore Jr. Johnny Moore Jr. is a fireball. He's smaller than me, but he's fast. He's moving up here, he's moving back there, he's moving all around and he doesn't slow down, not even when he's talking. I am not like that. I am round, I move slow, and you're gonna to have to deal with that. I may not be a fireball, but I brought my firebrand with me. Okay, it's not my firebrand. Let's get the name right from the beginning. This. <laughs> Always one in the crowd. No, yes. This is my iron of eternity. I was thinking about bringing the holy hand grenade in love, but I figured if I stayed up here too long, somebody might lob it at me. So, I brought my iron of eternity. Gonna have to remember that. I'm not gonna give you the name again. He will. If you want to turn to a page, we're at Luke chapter 18, 28 through 30. The reason why I call this the iron of eternity is because there's sort of two things you can think about when you think about an iron. You think about it when it's used properly, the lines come out really nice and sharp. And I know if you were paying attention last night instead of snoozing, which you better not have been, you realize two men know how to use an iron or their wives know how to use it because they were sharp dressed. You could split a hair with how sharp they were looking. <laughs> we're not talking about me. My iron's got dust on it, lots of it. I don't touch it except for examples like this. And then there's a wrong way to use it. And I only remember one time accidentally reaching out for it when it was wrong. I was a little kid, and fortunately it was in the process of heating up. It had not reached that ideal temperature. It hurt. It hurt like I don't know what. And keep that thought in mind. We're going to come back to that after we read this first passage. That was Luke chapter 18. And we're at verses 28 through 30. Then Peter said, See, we've left all and followed you. So he said to them, Assuredly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. Look at the list of who got left. We've got parents, brothers, wife, children for the sake of the kingdom of God. Now, talking about a generation before, an expression you would hear among people was, oh, if mama is in heaven, I don't want to be in heaven. I want to be where mama's at. <laughs> Fact is, there was a man that had a real hard time becoming a Christian. Because somebody made sure they let him know, your parents went to hell. You just got to accept that and get over it. I'm sorry, I don't get paid the kind of bucks to make that judgment. There's only one that knows that much, that's God. But for him, knowing where mama and dad were was important. Being where mama and dad was, was important. And for a good long time, he was not going to become a Christian because he wasn't going to desert mama and dad when it came to eternity. Now, it's one thing to say that, but if I put this thing up all the way and I put it on your back, who here is going to feel happier or more comforted knowing that mommy and daddy have it slammed in their back too? Do you feel better knowing that as bad as you're feeling right now with that iron burning into your flesh? Oh, but they're feeling the same kind of pain. I feel so much better now. No, we don't. Because we know here and now, this is bad nasty. It doesn't feel good even when you take it off. When we're talking about Leaving all those behind. First thing first. If you're in an airplane and you hit that pocket of air and that funny little thing comes dangling down in front of your face, what do they tell you to do? They tell you to put it on your wife because she's the most important woman in my world. 
They tell them, put it on your kids because I'm dead and I'm responsible for them. No. They say, put it on yourself, except it better not be an arm. <laughs> they tell you to put it on yourself because if you can't help yourself, you're not going to be good to anybody else. If you can't get right with God for yourself, doesn't matter who else was in that list. If you can't get it right for yourself, you can't help all the rest of those. You've got a foot, foot as puss. <laughs> Put as first the priority of seeking God, seeking him his way, no matter what else you're looking at. Amen. She might be the most beautiful woman in my life. God's got to come first. He's my firstborn son. God's still got to come first. Jesus wasn't telling them the rest don't matter. He was saying there's a right priority. That right priority is putting God where he belongs enthroned in your heart. And when it comes to eternity, the next passage we're going to be looking at, Luke 16, we're going to be sort of covering 19 through 31, but 22 through 24 is mainly where I'm going to be reading from. This is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus didn't have it so hot. Fact is, he had it, okay, that was a bad pun. He had it pretty miserably bad. He was so poor, he was covered in sores. He had that little hygiene going on. He couldn't get food to eat. And then you got the rich guy, and he's just porking out. He probably looked like me. He's eating all he wants. Well, guess what? One day, both of them die. And go ahead and I'll start reading from 22. So it was, the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, and he was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in the flame. Iron's burning in his back. No, it's far worse. Because you know what? Here on this earth, when the iron's burning in your back, guess what? You're still made in the image of God. When that iron's doing its worst, your body is doing its best to help you out in that bad situation. As bad as that burn may feel, you are still blessed by God. The one tormented in the flames had no blessing from God. There was nothing about what he was going through that was trying to make him any kind of better. We need to understand, when we're talking about hell, we're talking about a real that goes beyond the nastiest you can come up with. And I say real, because when you look at every single parable, every example that Jesus gave, you don't hear about the unicorns. You don't hear about the talking bunnies. You don't hear about anything made up. When he talks about planting seed in the ground, guess what? We plant seed in the ground. And when there's stones there, they don't grow as well. They don't get the right kind of root they need to get put down into because if the ground is packed down, there's nothing you can squeeze down into. And if it's covered in weeds, it's gonna choke it out because it's taking up the sunshine, it's taking up the nutrients, it's taking up everything it can and the plant doesn't grow, and that's real. And every example you look at when Jesus gives an example, the pearl of great price, everybody knows about pearls, right? They're worth a lot of money, right? That's real. When he talks about when Lazarus and the rich man die, do you think he's doing something he's never done before? Or is he doing the same kind of thing he's been doing all along? <coughs> Tell him like it is. If he's telling him like it is, being tormented in the flames, he was facing the worst there was. But here's the thing to remember. Remember that thing about being comforted and so forth? He's tormented in the flames. What doesn't he do? 
Never says, I'm sorry I messed up. Never says, I'm so thankful that Mama's here with me. And he also says, Father Abraham, Mr. Authority figure that I didn't bother paying attention to in life. Because you were the man that sought God. And that's what I should have been doing, but I didn't. Father Abraham, that guy next to you, the one that used to be covered in sores, have him go dip his hand in the water and bring it on over here to me. Who here wants to volunteer to get their hand wet and then face the iron? Because that's what he's demanding almost. He's saying, send him. He was worthless in life. Go ahead and send him now. He won't matter anyways if he's suffering. That's not what's written there. That's what he acted like. There's a reason he was in torment. And just because he wasn't, I mean, he was in torment, doesn't mean he was changing when he was on the wrong side of eternity. He was still who he was even when he was feeling the nasty burn mm -hmm. of eternity. We need to realize there's two sides to eternity. There's the side that looks good. Why? Because it is. It's awesome. Awesome beyond anything. Awesome beyond the outfits those guys wore yesterday even. And the nasty is nasty beyond anything you can think of. When I ruptured the disc in my back, it felt like my whole body was on fire. I screamed for a good half an hour. I was home alone because Vicky was at church. <laughs> I screamed my head off. And if you want to commit murder, I can tell you the neighborhood to do it in because you, they'll scream all they want. Doesn't matter. You're going to die. Nobody's going to show up. <laughs> There's a right side to eternity. There's a wrong side. And it's not some arbitrary thing made up. Because like I said, you can see in the rich man's behavior, even when he's being tormented, he's not getting any brighter than God, even when he knows how wrong he is. When the scripture talks about the demons knowing there's a God, yeah, they know. They're not doing anything about it. What? That's their nature. They're on the wrong side of eternity for a reason. Now, okay, my talk on eternity, my E in respect, is about children and parents. To get to the children's and parents part, one, I gotta put that down because I gotta turn to a different page. We're gonna be going to 1 John chapter two. Before we get to the children and parents part, we're gonna start with verse one, going one through six. <clears throat> that was 1 John, Chapter 2, starting out with verse 1 through 6. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly, the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself to walk just as he walked. My little children. He's talking to adults. He's talking to a congregation. My children. He's the one that's leading and instructing. But he's pointing back first to the Father. We got the Father. We got the next step on down. He includes Jesus because Jesus is our brother. He's putting himself sort of at that level because he's communicating God's word to them. And then you got that children level. There's a responsibility chain there. Where is the authority? Where is the understanding? It's in the Father. It's in God. Amen. Down below that, you've got the one that is responsible for communicating, responsible for following through in such a way that the children understand, that they learn 
They grow, they apply. Keep that thought in mind because we're going to jump down to verse 12. <clears throat> 12 through 14. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. I'm sorry, are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I've written to you, fathers, because you have known him who was from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. We got the same kind of pattern going on. It's like a ring. Because where's the beginning of a circle? There isn't one. Where is the end of a circle? There isn't one. If the father instructs, the child needs to be listening. When the child listens, it isn't just so they can hear dad. It's because they're supposed to be learning. And in learning, they're supposed to be taking it to that next level. The young man doing, applying what they were taught. <coughs> the things they were grounded in when they were little, now they're big enough to actually apply and whoa, it works just like Dad said. And then, after having gone through that stage in life of being a young man, you move on into fatherhood, you got the responsibility of passing it on to that next generation. And if it keeps going and going and going, what's something that keeps going and going and going? It's going on for eternity. The pattern God gave, he gave with the understanding that you do it, you follow what I said. And by the way, I start out by saying, if you love me, you're going to do what? Obey my commandments. You follow this pattern, it doesn't break. Why? Because if you as the father act responsibly towards your children, raise them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, there is a good chance, okay, I'm not going to say an absolute, because everybody has the right freedom of choice. But, it's designed, so applied properly, you're working on the good side of the odds. That child who learns from you, not just by what you say, by what they see you do. Because you know what happens when you tell them, you need to go to Sunday school. Well, Dad, you're still in bed. Mom's taking you. I'll be there later. What are you taught them? It doesn't really matter for me because I'm a big boy. And when you get to be a big boy, it don't need to matter to you. You need to go to that youth thing. Well, Dad, they need somebody to chaperone. Well, they can get somebody else. I'm busy. Dad, all you're doing is watching football. Hey! I'm dad. You don't smart off to me like that. I'm sorry. You just lied to him. The example we give needs to be consistent from beginning to end. We can't just go tell him you do what is right and show him a totally different life. We got to tell him, oh, you need to be doing. You need to show God's love by doing these kind of things. Well, what are you doing, dad? You make me go to all these youth activities where we go paint somebody's house, where we go clean up their yard, where we go and we go and we, what have you ever done, Dad? You make it to church most of the time, but I've never seen you help anybody. I'm going to brag on my kids. I'm crazy. I will bend over backwards to help Okay, yes, he's laughing because he knows I told you the truth. Amen. He'll tell me if I'm telling you something wrong. <laughs> He'll tell it to me too. When I was bringing up my kids, like I said, I'm crazy. I will pack every single second of the day. I will be trying to do everything I can to show them God. Whether that be fixing food for somebody, and they'll tell you, when it comes to somebody having a baby, and there's three people in that house, we send them at least enough food for six and a half, seven, eight, nine people. 
And I've been asked before, why are you giving them that much dessert? Because if I was on the receiving end, I'd want that much dessert. <laughs> when I give, I give the way I'd want to be receiving. But not just that. When I give, I'm giving an example. When my kids got old enough, every single one of my kids helped out here at Newberry on Thursday when it came to help feed the seniors. I didn't tell any of my kids, you know what you need to do? You need to go do that Thursday thing and help the seniors. They did that on their own initiative. No, they didn't. They did because that's what they had learned and been taught. Tyler will tell you. Even when it came to story time, when I'd be walking from our house all the way down to Publix, which was, I think, about a two-mile walk, and then we'd get our zebra cakes, and we'd get our whatever to drink, and then we'd swing it on down and walk it on back. They didn't want just the walk. They wanted the stories. So initially, it was always Star Wars stories. And know what I did? I told them how Luke messed up, because Luke didn't listen. He was told, you don't need to take that weapon into that cave. You're taking anger. You're taking hatred into that cave. And all you're going to reap from it is what you take with you. Luke failed because Luke was nurturing hatred in his heart. That's what I told him about Star Wars. All the way up to the time when I finally couldn't take that much more of Star Wars. In which case I started telling makeup stories. Chewbacca put on his eyeshadow. <laughs> finally got out of my telling of Star Wars stories. But, back on topic. It wasn't just telling them. You need to get right with God. I was doing best I could to show them every way I could how important God was to me. I included them in those activities because I wanted them to see what dad was doing so they could look back and say, hey, that's the norm because that's what dad showed me how to do. And when they got bigger, they started doing it. Tyler and Matthew, when they went off to college, they got to lead singing. Sierra, Ladies' Day, has been leading singing for how many years now? Three, four? Gets up and leads singing. Sometimes she's not young anymore, she's older now. But when she was littler, some of those guest speakers come and go, what? A little girl's gonna lead the singing? Oh, this is gonna go terrible. No, she's a good song leader. Fact is, out of the three of them, she gets the least opportunity to get up front and lead. Out of the three of them, she is practicing every time we sing. Half the time you'll watch and you look over, there's this little hand down here going like this. She's working on the beat. She's listening to the notes. Afterwards, she say, Dad, what about? And I said, I know, I know. It was off by this much. And she's actively preparing for the next time. Because guess what? One day she's going to be a mom, probably. One day he's going to be a dad. One day they're going to move up into that third stage. The only way that third stage is going to work is if they teach, not only by what comes out of here, by what they do. The whole package. And where did that chapter start off with? If you love me, I'm God the Father. What are you going to do? You're going to obey my commandments. Amen. Why? Because this is real. It's nasty real if you're on the wrong side of it. If I don't do my best, I've decreased the likelihood he's going to succeed. Because if I set the wrong example, he's imitating. The best opportunity for ending up on the right side is doing our best putting the mask on us first taking care of making sure we're getting it right based on God's word
and then showing that to others. Coming alongside. That's what discipling is. It's not going out and telling somebody and telling somebody and telling somebody until you wear them down. It's showing them God's love at the same time you're telling. James chapter 1. Faith without works is dead. We need to really pull the two together. It can start here. It needs to start here because they got to know what it is they're seeing. But there needs to be the follow through as well. And when you bring those two things together, 1 John chapter 2 can happen. Because when you teach them the right parent image, they're that much more likely to be able to succeed at teaching their own kids that right parent image. And oh, by the way, when's Tyler stop being my child? I've already got the head shaking. Never. Once a child, always my child. Always my responsibility. If I'm 60, if I'm 70 years old, no, I'm not there yet. I may look it, but if I'm 60, if I'm 70, I still got the responsibility of training him to go the right way. I call my parents on a regular basis. Why? Because they've been that much farther down the road than me. Why? I'm here today because of the example they gave. Why? The more I can learn now, the more I can pass on to them. And that ring can go on and on and on. There's the eternity of the final judgment. There's the eternity of the loop that God has placed in this scripture from the beginning. Because in the beginning, he told Adam and Eve, don't touch that. Mm -hmm. They didn't listen. Mm -hmm. Throughout the Old Testament, there's a whole lot of, I told you, don't touch that. And they're still not listening. He gives warning, like with Cain. Sin's crouching at the door. It's ready to master you. You need to master it. <laughs> God doesn't back off. He keeps doing the right parental thing in spite of their messed up wrong. He sent his son for the whole world because he cares. He doesn't want us on the wrong side of the eternal army. He wants all of us looking just as good as those other two guys did last night. The word is yours. Thank you for your time. Amen.